went to one of those East Coast colleges <laughs> as an undergraduate. <laughs> but uh, my training here is in computer science. I got my, uh, whoops, this is slipping. Mark? Uh, I can actually hold your voice without it. What do you say? Could you hear that? Mm -hmm. If I give out, I, I brought some juice just to keep it going. Uh, So uh, 10 years ago, I finished a PhD in computer science, and uh, I've been working in that field until very recently. I got much more involved a couple of years ago in uh, community affairs and working on some other things. So you might say I was in a uh, the most spectacular midlife crisis you could imagine. Uh, was that before you got sick, or? Well, I'm saying that I was, I was uh, in the middle of changing my career when this hit. When this hit you. Yeah. So. Uh, and how long ago was that? Uh, I first had an acute onset uh, in beginning of September of 1989, and until then, I was not sick for a day in my life, virtually. So this was out of the clear blue sky, uh, which was part of the problem. Let me just speak very briefly about the medical history so we can, everybody will be familiar with that. Uh, as I said, there was no warning, and uh, I had some pains in my side that were very severe. I can remember I had spent a very active day taking my aunt across the Golden Gate Bridge. We walked across the bridge and had a nice dinner, and I was driving back on 101, and all of a sudden, oh, very sharp pain in my side. And uh, I went through a month of tests where various uh, relatively benign diagnoses were ruled out one after the other. And finally, at the end of October of 89, I uh, uh, had surgery. It was clear from uh, biopsies and CT scans that there was a, a mass in my stomach and some suggestion of something in the liver. And apparently, this is a very quiet area called because there were really no symptoms at all. That was the problem, because by the time they operated on me, uh, the horse was out of the barn. Uh, they removed a large mass, maybe as large as my fist. Uh, took them about a week to identify through pathology, which I kept hoping all these signs that, well, it must be the bureaucracy and working its way up and getting different signatures. It turned out to be a relatively rare type of cancer. Not, not unknown, but the sort of thing that turns up maybe three or four times a year at Stanford. Uh, it's a leiomyosarcoma. Probably some of you know more about what that means than I do. Uh, and it had indeed spread from the stomach to my liver, possibly to the kidney, some other uh, places. And unfortunately, uh, this is a type of cancer which is, uh, uh, can't be treated by radiation, certainly not in the liver. Uh, it takes more radiation than the liver can accept. And there really is no uh, chemotherapy that they know of that's effective against it. In short, uh, this was a fatal diagnosis. I went in about uh oh eight or ten weeks from never having been sick a day in my life to a death sentence, which was quite a an experience I hope none of, none of you ever have. Uh, so that was my medical diagnosis of what what happened to me. Uh, since then, I have uh, attempted a range of different 
experimental therapies. Uh, uh, my doctor told me the first day that uh, there was no cure for this, that I had six to 18 months to live based on what they, statistics that they had. Uh, I felt I had no choice but to uh, try what might be available. And I had a whole range of different treatments. Uh, I came very close to having liver surgery right after the uh, stomach surgery um, on the chance that the tumor had only spread to the liver and only in one site and that we could get it all by surgery. Uh, this, uh, the doctors were not much in favor of this uh, because they felt there was about a one in a thousand chance that was true and a one in 10 chance of dying from the operation. Still, I had it scheduled and I was within a few days of doing it. Uh, but my doctor went to a meeting where she met a, one of the leading experts in sarcoma who recommended seeing a specialist in Los Angeles who had a different technique called chemoembolization, using a catheter to go up an artery and <coughs> with a mixture of chemotherapy and extremely fine protein to try to uh, block the small blood vessels coming to the tumor, uh, which would have a double effect, to starve the tumor of its blood supply and to concentrate a higher dosage of drug at the right site. Uh, the doctor there was very, uh, he was a real cowboy, uh, very aggressive, but we were on the same wavelength about this. This is what I wanted to do, and he had fairly good success rate in his last dozen or so patients. Uh, I went there for five treatments over two months, and unfortunately it didn't work for me. Uh, it's a very difficult procedure. I was on a, uh, something about a third the width of this table for about five hours. We got an ironing board under fluoroscope control. Uh, I don't know how much detail you want to hear about all of this, but it gives you, a, there's a whole range of different things that happen. Uh, and it was one of those situations where they had to put together the catheters and work them in there. It was like trying to unlock your car with a, a uh, coat hanger, only more difficult, much more difficult than that. And the, each procedure took about four or five hours. Every, everybody worked very hard except me. All I had to do was sort of endure it. I was half floating and my mind was on the ceiling, just sedated enough so that I wouldn't feel too much, but they could ask me questions. I could retrieve my mind briefly and reply, and they would go on. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the, they only were able to get to the right sites because the anatomy was very complicated. Only were able to get there once. The uh, chemo had no effect that time. And they, uh, they gave up. They saw other sites as well. Uh, this was followed by a standard chemotherapy regimen, which had had some success. Uh, and the hope for that was, if that worked, I could qualify for uh, yet a, another step up, an autologous bone marrow transplant, where they remove your bone marrow, give you an ultra high dose of chemotherapy, which would ordinarily kill your bone marrow and kill you. Uh, but the trick was they took it out first and put it back in later. Uh, this, this involved a standard uh, two courses of one week of chemotherapy at Stanford. Uh, however, that had no effect either. Uh, I became interested in, in other methods, biological approaches, and I independently tracked down uh, with some help 
uh, which I could describe. Uh, some people at MD Anderson in Houston were working with interferon. And uh, starting in, in August and September, I injected myself three times a week with interferon. Uh, another ex experience. Uh, that again did not help. They'd had a little bit of success there, very practically oriented of one or two patients who had uh, done well with a with Velbat, an old type of chemotherapy, following failure on interferon. So I had a pump installed for that and a catheter run up here. This was done at home, in fact. I walked around with a pump for, uh, for several weeks. That did not work either. By the way, all these treatments were the sort of, what can I do to be the one in a thousand person to, to beat these medical odds? The last thing I tried, this, this now takes us to uh, October, it's past October. Uh, up until then, I was in very good physical shape when I started all of this. I weighed about 40 pounds more than I weigh now. You can see some of the, the skin just falling off, sort of cadaverous look. Uh, but it was largely due to my good physical condition and attitude and many factors that mm -hmm. I went through pretty well with all these things. But starting in October, I began to have problems with uh, tumors coming in through uh, my stomach region, fluid entering the body cavity. You can see that it's, it's swollen. I wasn't aware of losing weight for a while because my bathroom scale always read the same. Mm -hmm. But in fact, my arms and legs were turning to sticks while, while my belly was filling up with fluid. Uh, I began to have real trouble eating because it's, uh, those of you who may have been pregnant have had some sensation of this where there's enough pressure pushing on you to cause various problems. Uh, I had trouble eating and digesting. I began to lose weight, lose strength. Uh, but I was, I was set, I felt, for one more try. There was another experimental program at Stanford which had some rationale, a uh, combination of chemotherapy and cyclosporin. Cyclosporin you probably know from transplantation to reject, uh, to prevent the rejection of tissue. And it turns out, coincidentally, that cyclosporin also, uh, the theory is, it works on a, uh, on a little molecular pump that's supposed to be in the cancer cells, which cause the cancer to pump the chemo right through. The reason they say that the, that the chemotherapy is not effective is that it, it, as fast as it enters the, the cancer cell, it's pumped out again by this molecular pump. And cyclosporin was supposed to block the action of this pump. So that was worth a try. Uh, and in the beginning of December, uh, I went in again to uh, Stafford Hospital and did one course of this. Uh, which really prostrated me for a month. I was really, all through the, the terrible cold spell, you remember, mm. I was just uh, a wreck. I'm very depressed. Uh, I'm really coming to the breaking point with all of this. And it also became evident, I could feel there's one prominent tumor site here and several others. So I could feel without testing uh, any CT scans or whatever that, uh, not only was the treatment debilitating, but it wasn't helping. So I decided uh, right around New Year's that uh, that was enough. And uh, I had my appointment with the doctor in charge of the protocol. We'd normally go through two cycles, but we both agreed that it was not uh, useful to do so. 
and so here I am. Uh, so I, you quit aggressive therapy in December. That was the last aggressive Relax. therapy I had. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a whole other dimension to my life while all of this is going on, which has, I think, as much bearing on some of the issues that you may be interested in. Uh, but now, as far as I'm able, that's what I'm doing full time. I have uh, a wife whom I love very much. I have two boys who are about to turn six and 12. I spend a lot of time with them. I'm working on my projects as much as I can. And, and this I consider to be a very important activity also because uh, there are some things that I learned throughout this experience about uh, what's important to me as a patient when you cross that line uh, and what you need to do and what uh, the medical staff and your, your wider support groups and everybody else can do to help or to make things worse. I think that's really the important thing. Uh, what are some of these important insights that have come to you? I'm glad you asked because I wrote some of them down. Good. <laughs> I think the main one is, is just common sense. And that is to empathize, to put yourself in the shoes of your patient as much as possible. Uh, many, of, many of the things I'm going to say really lead back to that principle. Uh, and I know that that counters, flies in the face a little bit of the uh, training of professional detachment. And believe me, I appreciate how important it is for uh, a doctor, especially an oncologist, who has to deal with patients like me who they feel, with all their scientific training, is going to die, that it won't be very pleasant, uh, that they have to go home at night and deal with their six and 12-year-olds and everything else. And that's essential, and I don't begrudge them that at all. But they really have to uh, put themselves in your shoes as much as they can and understand what's going on with you. Uh, if this, let me just consult this a little bit. This will help me a mm -hmm. bit. Uh, you know, it's 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 very hard. There's a there's a line that divides people who have passed over into the condition I'm in from everybody else. I I can't really put it into words. I think you understand what I mean. In a way, there's no way that I could convey to you this feeling of, of the death sentence and, and how it changes your life. It's something you'll probably hear many times in, in your career. But uh, you just have to appreciate that that's there and that as far as possible, get as close to your patient as you can. Second thing, and also very important to me, in this kind of situation, and I'm talking about a, a situation where uh, where the odds are really very poor, where your scientific training says uh, from day one, you know, a reasonable thing to do in your case would be just to take uh, uh, narcotics and go fishing. Um, and that was in fact suggested to me on day one and throughout. Hmm. That's you know, you can stop. You don't have to do this. Uh, but I think the second point I'd like to emphasize is how important it is for the doctors, the medical staff, to foster a patient's feeling of control and of hope to whatever extent you can, even if, they're, even if that's very, very small. Uh, you know, you've, you've got to build all of this on a foundation of honesty. Uh, when first the surgeon and then the oncologist told me after the results of the post-operative test,
tests came back that yes, the mass we saw was the same type of cancer, that this is really what's going to happen. I needed to know that right away. I'm not so sure I needed to know six to 18 months or a specific figure. I've chewed that around a little bit. Uh, it's been 15 months now, I'm still with us. But it's got to be first on a foundation of honesty. Mm -hmm. Now, how can you try to give somebody in my situation mm -hmm. a feeling of control and of hope in the face of all of this? Mm -hmm. What do you do? That's the art that you're trying to learn, I think. Uh, I would say that uh, you shouldn't fear or disparage any effort that the patient makes to try to build that support for himself. Uh, you can judge different types of patients, I think. Some who are ready to say, yes, give me that fishing line right now. I'm going fishing and that's it. Uh, I, I'm just going to spend the time as best I can. In my case, I saw really no alternative to doing whatever I could on the off chance that something might happen, that, that I would be the one who would have the miracle, or at least that would prolong my life uh, up to a point. And as I said, I reached a point where that was, where, where the type of hope I had had changed. Uh, but the control was also vital. I wouldn't disparage any effort. Uh, Around about uh, December of uh, 1989, this is uh, after my operation and when I was just starting the chemoembolization in Los Angeles, several people told me about a cancer support group in Menlo Park called the Creighton Institute. Some of you may have heard of it. There are a whole range of cancer support groups. This one is more holistic or new age than, uh, than many of the others. But uh, they had a, a feeling about this that uh, through your own efforts, through visualization, through imagery, through uh, belief in the fact uh, that there might be a way in which uh, your own body could summon uh, its own defenses against the cancer. Now, I was raised up in a very scientific, rational background. I was very skeptical mm -hmm. about this sort of thing. Although when you cross that line I talked about, all of a sudden you begin to see signs and portents that life isn't quite so rational as you thought before. And I heard about this program on the same day from three different people who didn't know each other and had completely different backgrounds. And I was persuaded to look into it because it was highly recommended to me by a classic type A Silicon Valley bust ass type of guy. I said, if he believes that this stuff was the most valuable thing that he had done, then it's worth looking into. So I did that, and I must tell you that uh, it has not cured me of cancer, but it carried me through several very rough months with the feeling of there was something that I could do every day, mm -hmm. and at the very least, this, this did wonders for my, for my mental health, and it brought me into contact also with a group of people who knew what I was going through, who were on my, the same side of the line as I was, and who were not afraid to touch and feel and all those great California things that you came here for. <laughs> uh, very, very important to me, as it turned out. I would say that uh, I continued faithfully, and that's the right word, on 
a uh, daily regime of at least visualizing mm -hmm. for about six months. And it was sort of the, re the repeated uh, failures on the medical side that finally made me say, well, you know, up till now I've been able to say things would have been worse without this. And finally I, I came to say, well, uh, I'm just going to suspend my belief. I'm not going to disbelieve all of this, but I just have to get very quiet about it and do what I can. But it was really vital for me. Now, my doctor, uh, my oncologist, uh, was hostile towards this. She knew I was doing it. And she said, you know, it's your money if you want to do this sort of thing. And I can imagine this is a field which is uh, uh, rife for charlatans to exploit. Uh, people get very desperate and they're willing to try anything. And again, here's this art I'm talking about, where you have to em empathize with and understand your patient. Mm -hmm. Getting onto my wavelength, wavelength, she would understand that this was something that I felt, why, why not do this? I was in the fortunate position of being financially secure enough to do this. So I was able to do that without that being a consideration. Uh, she said she didn't believe in mind over matter or the sorts of things that, uh, that were being purveyed these days. To me, there was just enough evidence. It was no worse in the sense than the predicament I was already in. Mm. The odds seemed, you know, what's the difference between one in a thousand, one in a million? Uh, so I still went ahead and did that. And I stayed with her. I thought seriously about changing doctors. And what I did instead was to get another one and saw two different doctors, the other one just from time to time. But he had a much more, uh, he was much more sympathetic toward this whole endeavor. And the two offered a very nice balance to be. And that's another point. Don't feel threatened at all if your patients are seeking help, even from other doctors. If they want to get up and leave, they'll tell you. Uh, but at the meantime, you need to build as much support as they can. I have now gone to uh, the memorial services of two of the people within my group just within the past, well, one was in August, and one was just in January. Uh, and a, a third friend for that group is sinking very fast. It makes me a little bit nervous because I saw him a month ago and he was on his feet and walking around the neighborhood and now he doesn't get out of bed. Uh, so the end for him has come quite fast. In spite of that, I think that everybody there felt a strong community mm. we built. It was, that was very, very important. I could have. Oops. You, <coughs> you spoke about control and hope. <coughs> could you say a little more about um, the changing locus of hope <coughs> as the disease um, progressed? The major change in hope is, uh, for me, was pretty recent. It's a question of changing one's hopes from, am I going to survive this, to how do I best live? What shall I do with my life at this point? Uh, I could be a little more dramatic about it and say, how shall I die? What, what is a what are the right sorts of, uh, how shall I have people remember me? That's not quite what I mean, though. I'm still emphasizing the things that I'm doing right. in the here and now. But it's a hope, 
for making my life as as positive as it can be. Uh, I still have some uh, quixotic projects apart from some community volunteering and working in my children's school. Uh, I, I invented a board game during all of this time. Huh. This was one of my great therapies. Uh, <coughs> and it was an idea I'd had for a long time. And I finally had the time to do it. And I was able to see over a period of six months or so, going from nothing to a room full of people laughing. Now, I'd warn you against getting into the game business. It's, it's <laughs> the easy part is inventing the game, but that's very hard. Uh, in fact, this very morning, I was trying to contact uh, another game company that hasn't been returning my calls. So trying to sell it is the hard part. If anybody knows anybody in the industry, <laughs> see me after class. Uh, but it provided a wonderful therapy. Mm -hmm. I've always liked to joke. Uh, my sense of humor has been affected because it's always it's going out of my mind, but it comes out of my mouth. But now I've got to ration how much I say <laughs> so that it cuts down on it a bit. Uh, but it had everything. It had creativity. It had focus, uh, or I'd be in the garage with an exacto knife and spray glue and it really had a physical stuff and a yeah. roller and all this kind of thing. So uh, so that was uh, that was something that made me feel very good, even if it if it goes no further mm -hmm. than this. Uh, where the hope goes from here, I, I think that there will still be changes. Uh, my fear uh, right now, my fear was, let's say a month ago, that I would face a choice between being in great pain and being doped up all the time. And I finally got up the nerve to, to ask uh, the doctor about this. Uh, and I'm glad I did because uh, the subject of pain, people have learned a great deal about that in recent times. And it seems it's much more controllable. Uh, attitudes have changed. There isn't a, uh, a stigma about uh, the use of painkillers the way it was before, although I think not all the medical profession feels that way. There's still a large residue of, uh, of thinking from the old days where narcotics were bad and all this sort of thing. Uh, but anyway, I think that uh, I'm not afraid of that now. And so my, my hopes are still of living, uh, living well the days that I have, keeping as much strength as I have. Early will tell you that I came to talk to him just two weeks ago, and my voice was a great deal stronger oh, yeah. than it was then. I'm surprised <laughs> at how fast uh, I have weakened in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so I'm glad we're doing this today. Uh, I haven't spoken at this length since I spoke to you. I've really been saving it up. Take your time, by the way. Don't don't let your no. throat get dry. No. Let me uh, maybe go down my, my list a little yes. bit. Yes. Uh, another point I'd like to urge on everybody is to help the patient build a support system and to reinforce his own status wherever it's possible to do that give you some examples. Uh, the support system. Very important for, for me was my wife went to most of my uh, meetings with doctors, especially the, not, just, not the ordinary checkups perhaps, but times that we knew that important results were coming or decisions would be made. And it was so much better You've all had this experience 
of having another set of ears in the room. That was very, very important. So as a doctor, I would say, if possible, help the patient to find someone who will come with them. And not just for the, the su for support, you know, hold your hand or pass the time, but also you could talk it over. What did they mean by that? And she will often have an interpretation or understand something more clearly than I did. Or I might be alarmed by something. She said, no, 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 that's not what she meant. And it was not quite so bad. Uh, I mentioned about not objecting to other sources of information, including other doctors. Very important. A central point is treating the patient as a client. Uh, it's, uh, it's like in, in Perry Mason. Somebody walks in, and he's there, and, he, and uh, Perry is his lawyer. And uh, they're, they're basically equal people, but he's got the skills and knowledge to uh, save you from the gas chamber. Well, that's why you come to see a doctor. But you should be, you should look at your patient as basically being on equal terms as somebody who has hired you for these purposes. Uh, one aspect of that, which I found uh, very important, is keeping the medical records open and available to the patient. Uh, and my doctors, by and large, did that very well. They had no objections if, uh, if I were going off to Houston or Los Angeles to see one of these specialists. My oncologist would give me a letter meant for the doctor, uh, but she didn't seal it. She said, you can read it, make a copy of it if you want. Uh, I have to tell you that several months ago I decided to stop reading them because they were not, uh, there was no good news in any of these letters. But just knowing that there was that kind of openness was very important to me. And I know that some people uh, don't want to know these things from the start. Just you take it, you do it. Uh, my father-in-law, other relatives of that generation are very much like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way, the status thing, again, I think that many of the doctors that I saw viewed me naturally as a contemporary, as somebody of a, a professional background. Uh, I present myself nicely, except when I spill juice all over my, <laughs> my shirt. We all do that. Uh, <laughs> And so they were able to say, okay, here's a person that we will treat as an equal. Uh, we won't condescend, we won't keep things mm -hmm. from them. And I would say do that for everybody, except those who plead with you, I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. And even then, that's the art of, of empathizing, of getting into your patients and understanding as far as possible what they need. Another point, I think that in a situation like mine, which I guess is fairly unusual, uh, even in a disease like cancer, uh, in many types of cancer, the odds are a lot better of the cancer I happen to get. Mm. You at least have a fighting chance, and you can prolong life over several years. In the case, like mine, where uh, the odds are just appalling from the start. I think you can expect an alter alternation between periods of frantic searching and, and alternating with a commitment to some plan. I found several times as we would get to the end of one unsuccessful treatment, I would just uh, uh, have some friends help me with a bedline search or write people or get on the phone. I mentioned about tracking down the protocol at MD Anderson. I did that. Here's a, this is a, 
Uh, another telling anecdote. I bought a book on the immune system, and I, I called the author. And the author says, well, I don't know of anything for uh, this type of sarcoma, but why don't you call this gentleman who works at Zoma? He's the head of research at Zoma in Berkeley. It's a biotechnology firm. This man doesn't know me from Adam, but he got on the telephone and called around and identified somebody at MD Anderson in, in Houston. And it turned out it was not quite the right person, but he was able to get it to the right person who lived there. He never expected anything from me, all that. And I called him up to thank him, but he said, I did this because I didn't want you to feel alone. Uh. Now, this is, a, this is these extra gestures are of such tremendous value to my morale. Mm -hmm. And this is something you should keep in mind. I'll give you another example of that, why that's so important. The first time I went to Los Angeles, and I, it, was a, it was a gray day. I was on my own. This is one of the few times my wife was not with me at the start of something significant. And I ended up with a room that was facing a brick wall. The weather was terrible, and I was scared and depressed. And I called the nurse, and I said, I am so depressed. Look at this place. Is there anything you can do? And by golly, I was lucky. It turns out that a man who had been there for a bone marrow transplant, had been in the isolation room for a month, had been discharged the day before. In his room, they give the, the isolation patients the nicest rooms, the best views. There was nobody coming in there the next day, but she took the time. She didn't belittle it. She sat with me. She explained everything. I'll see what I can do. And she got me that better room. And I felt a thousand percent better. She didn't have to do that. There were many other patients to treat. But in fact, everybody, the, the, uh, I, would, I would go out of my way to, uh, to praise the, the people at, at the Norris Cancer Hospital at USC, uh, who, from the person who pushed the wheelchair to the big boss doctor, were all very friendly and had a nice word. And I just wish that, that everybody could get what I got there. And as an aside, talking to a nurse, she talked about how she had managed to flee LA General, which is across the street and where instead of one nurse for three patients, there might be one nurse for two dozen patients. And that's something else in this whole realm that you will all have to think about. Everybody should get the same quality of care as I had from that nurse who made me feel better that day. And we shouldn't have to divide things up. So. So extra gestures, even small ones, boost your morale tremendously. The other side is also true. Small slights, things that you don't even think about, can hurt a patient tremendously. Uh, my post-operative recovery in uh, the original stomach operation was, uh, it was in the new wing of the hospital. Really quite a nice facility. Everybody there was wonderful. I was jolted out of my little bubble by, uh, they had to take me down for a leak test to see whether everything had stitched together well enough for me to eat and drink again. Sent me down to x-ray. And some person came along and wheeled me down there and left me, didn't say a word, out in the middle of the corridor, and sort of hustled me onto a table and pushed and pulled. And I thought, oh, 
God, it's just back to reality after uh, how nice it had been. Uh, that's just faultless and not acceptable. So it really works it, uh, and out of proportion. It, it really is magnified on both sides of the scale. Mm. Time out for a little juice. Try not to spill. Another point I'd like to make is to make is to do whatever you can as part of a, of a medical staff to make the physical and institutional surroundings as pleasant as possible. That's very, very important. Uh, and I, I use this by example, uh, my experience at uh, Stanford. And I could do that without feeling too guilty about it because I know that there is money now to fix it and there are plans underway to improve the, the facility. Uh, the cancer ward at Stanford is disgusting. It's brutal. There's no other way to describe it. The moment you walk in there, it smells bad. It's either something in the ventilation system or some of the drugs that they use. I don't know what. The lighting is very poor. Uh, there are few places to get away from a room in, in a lounge where you could sit comfortably and have a have decent lighting. Uh, and I, I've also been in rooms with five people at a time in a very small room. Uh, and these are things that depress the heck out of you. It's just awful. And the interesting thing is that the people who are working there, uh, none of them are aware of the smell. I think after you've worked there for a while, you just don't sense it anymore. Uh, but it's something they should be aware of. Uh, and as far as institutional arrangements are concerned, the story I've told you, <laughs> the last time I was there, the cyclosporin regime, the smell had not improved. Uh, things were the same, but um, the food services at the hospital are appalling. They are the, the sort of opposite, the polar opposite of what healthy food should be. And the only bright side I could get out of that was that uh, I was having uncontrollable hiccups because of all the pressure. I mean, nothing I could do, none of my old tricks, drinking a glass of water, eating sugar, whatever, holding my breath, nothing worked. I came back to my room from a shower, hiccuping down the hallway, which is very painful and very weak. It's, no, it's not fun. And the food services had been there to deliver lunch, and this thing was sitting on the tray table, and it was so disgusting the smell of the side of it, that I started to gag, I started to throw up, my hiccups stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and the nurse said, oh yes, that's another way to stop hiccuping. And I, I found after that, I was able to stick a finger down my throat and stop the hiccups just by getting a gag reflex. Uh, I understand the problems of institutional cooking. It's a very low status situation, uh, but it just something has to be done about that. So wherever you are, physical and institutional arrangements, very important. Patients feel that all the time. I guess those are most of the points I wanted to make about my direct care as a patient. I just wanted to throw in one other somewhat related idea. Being in a kind of a marginal disease category, three or four cases a year at Stanford, uh, I have been extremely frustrated at how few people are involved in the research and how slowly it's going. And I look with envy and some anger 
at, uh, at the AIDS people and how they have been able to uh, organize the political muscle to begin to change the way that research is done. And I've even read recently how uh, women with breast cancer are also organizing because there are enough of them to also make an impact like that. They're taking their lesson from the AIDS people. Uh, I've read articles and I, you know, I've read Scientific American and the latest article by Steven Rosenberg and you know, this and that's happening and in two years we'll do this and in three years we'll do that. And I'm practically screaming, come on already, I can't wait that long. That's what the AIDS people are talking about. Uh, I have many good friends in research. My first, uh, my first job out of college was uh, at NIH. I understand that environment very well. Uh, and as I said, I was raised very scientifically. And I could appreciate the feeling that results that we get now might be tainted in a way we can't rely upon them in future years. But when somebody tells you on day one that you have six to 18 months to live, and you say, hmm. well, in two years, we're going to go moving on to the next step, you say, something's got to happen faster than that. So that's, that's a somewhat different topic, but something else that I wanted to mention to all of you. So that maybe is a good time to answer questions. Mm -hmm. I have uh, I have one. Well, I have two questions, and then maybe we'll open it up. The first question has to do with um, what other what are other decisions have you made or are you making about the way you die? Um, you mentioned that you decided back in December not to go for any more aggressive treatments. Are you thinking about when the final phase comes, what you want and what you don't, don't want, and how are you letting that be known? On the same day that I decided that I, I actually officially uh, agreed with the doctor at Stanford, uh, I got the forms for this durable power of attorney, or whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. For health care. For health care. And it's actually relatively simple to fill out. And I filled it out to say that, uh, in my case, I didn't want heroic measures. And if possible, I want to die at home in bed. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much how I wish it. Uh, I have talked. I've written down, I've talked with my wife, I've written down uh, what I want the way of my funeral arrangements. We, we, just, we just did that in the space of a day or two. I think we both realized that this was the, this was the moment to do it. Mm -hmm. We had to get past that mm -hmm. right away. So maybe that's another piece of advice, not to let that linger on as something you'll face later. So it was all in one, one decision. And now that's behind you and now you can move on. That's right. Uh, the other question had to do with the lectureship um, that is yeah. to be set up in memory of Jonathan King. Um, could you tell us how that idea started and what you hope to accomplish through the lectureship? Have you said much about this? No, no. not much. Uh, one of my good friends here at Stafford is, uh, is Ted Shortliff, professor at the medical school. Uh, and he's in a field called medical informatics, which uh, used to be called uh, medical decision making. It's a computer and mathematics oriented uh, program for graduate students, many of whom are already have MDs. 
how they learn about the use of these analytical tools for making decisions. Ted came to visit me several weeks ago, and he mentioned uh, someone else who had been a colleague of his who also died of cancer and who, before he died, had set up a memorial which had to do with, uh, I believe, research exchange between Stanford and the VA hospital. And Ted asked me, was there anything that I might like? And it, it's, it's incredible. I, I, never, I never thought of that, and I, and I should have. And it's gotten me thinking about other things as well. But uh, I thought about that, and I called him back. And what was uppermost in my mind was trying to convey to a group of people first thinking of his own students, of the importance of the, of the patient in all of the decision making, and that uh, otherwise some of this so-called medical decision making uh, might turn into a sort of disembodied analytical exercise. And this is something that I want to prevent. Uh, it turns out I have other friends through the community work that I've done, uh, one of whom used to be uh, chief administrator at the hospital. I didn't know that. I knew he was a, a firefighter and a parachute jumper that worked at Alza, uh, who thought this was a wonderful idea. And uh, they both, both uh, Ted Shortliff and Peter Carpenter, this other gentleman, uh, got uh, Tom Raffin and, and also Erdley Young interested in this idea. It turns out that there was much more interest than just the group of students that Ted was dealing with. Uh, I would like to see a lecture uh, every year that whose basic point is just to remind people of some of the things that I've been talking about today. Uh, and to do it by, as far as possible, having specific examples from doctors, nurses, other members of medical staff, members of uh, medical institutions, patients. I, I would like to include all of them at one time or another be able to talk about their experiences and build on something. I, I'm, I'm certainly not alone in all of this. All of you must be aware that just your being here means that you're part of a movement which is trying to make this happen. I think you need as much reinforcement as you can get because it's very difficult to, to move the 800-pound gorilla. Uh, but I feel it's a contribution that uh, will just be a, a good reminder every year of this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I expect within the next few weeks that whatever necessary approvals or whatever uh, will come to pass. And I have my friends in the community organizations who are interested in uh, co-sponsoring and perhaps underwriting us. Uh, there'll be some need for expense money and so forth. Uh, and I'd also like to be there, make a, a three-minute introduction, and through the magic of editing, you could say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jonathan King. Welcome to the 20th annual lecture. And God willing, maybe I'll even be there myself. Mm -hmm. Simone. I think that I really would like to thank you for coming because this is not just my first time coming back to the world, but it's just an education. I lost my two classes in the ages, but I would be happy to discuss them. Um, Gilda, you didn't mention that. Thank you. 
I have not run into a situation where uh, the patient, where the where the doctor, has uh, been so close to it that there really was an emotional response like that. Uh, so I'm not sure from my own experience how to answer that. I have seen the doctor in Los Angeles who had had a sort of a a success rate of the last 11 patients and he ran into me and couldn't do anything. And the last time I talked to him, he said, this was a very humbling experience. Uh, and I'm still not quite sure how to take that. Uh, <laughs> whether he thought he was super bad and could do everything, but he couldn't, it turned out. Or whether he meant something more spiritual I think in his case it was uh, more of Superman. But uh, apart from that, I just don't know what to say. It's hard to imagine. Uh, you know, we have all these idealized images from Marcus Welby and Dr. Kildare and going all the way back where many of these things happened. And somehow Robert Young was always able to be there and hold your hand, but hold the rest of the family together too without losing his cool too much. Uh, it, it just doesn't seem to work like that from my own experience. I hope that answers your question. I don't think it does. What would you want? Would you want somebody who remain relatively detached while being em empathetic? Or would you want somebody who was real in terms of the emotions she was feeling as she attempted to take care of you? I think the, that the, the doctor that I've been working with is, uh, has made every effort to empathize. Uh, Something happened in the last year. Her uncle died of cancer. And it was the first time that uh, somebody that close to her had died of cancer, in spite of all the patients that she had had. And she told me after this had happened that this was very upsetting. And now she thought she finally understood a little bit more what was happening. I think that a, a certain amount of, 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 uh, of professional bearing is essential mm -hmm. just, to, just to have somebody you can rely on time after time. But uh, my other doctor, for example, is much more touchy-feely and he'll, he'll hug me and uh, you know, he never quite knows how much hair I'll have when I walk in the next time. He says, hi, Curly. And <laughs> rubs the top of my head for good luck. Uh, that's not quite the same thing. But uh, I guess when it comes down to it, a certain amount of, the doctors themselves have to maintain a certain amount of, of distance. Otherwise, the patients couldn't rely on them consistently. Does that mean she was on the same wavelength that I was? No, not entirely. But uh, I stuck with her and she stuck with me. I have made the right decisions from the very beginning to the very end. I don't regret a single decision that I made in all of this. And that's a lot coming from me because I've always been somebody who's second guessed and looked back, oh, I should have done this and I should have done that. But not in this case. I think I did the right thing. I owed it to myself. I owed it to my family. I was able, my, my sons 
have gone through something with me that at least the older one will remember well, that the younger one will have some memory of. Uh, that's another point I guess I should mention. Mm -hmm. uh, I have always been as frank as possible with the older son who was about to turn 12, give you some idea. Uh, and it would help me very much also. At first, I used to worry, what could I say? What should I say? Oh, so finally I realized I just had to tell him what was happening. And he bore up very well, and it was a great sense of, of comfort to me to be able to glimpse a little bit of the man that he will be, and not just the boy that he is. But I finally decided to stop. I came home, and I sat with him on the sofa, and I told him, and it was, it all came pouring out. You know, you, when you're in the middle of these treatments, each of them feels, well, we, we didn't, that, that one didn't work. What's next? Let's go on to that. What's next? I can't describe to you the relief that I felt that day. No more needles. No more being stuck. All of the things I had suppressed the hours on the ironing board. And he was with me while I told him all of that. He'll never forget that. He'll understand that. I know he will. That was very important. And my younger son, that was, that was more a riddle to me. What shall I do? Here's a boy who's five years old. What can you say to him? He lives for today. He doesn't know what happens two days from now or two days ago. But I noticed several months ago that in a way he had withdrawn from me, and that he was always doing things with Bob. Uh, and it occurred to me all of a sudden that, that was exactly right, that he had his emotional response that he knew somehow that things were different and he was setting up a distance between us. And it saddened me because we were very close. We did many things together, read stories to him all the time, took him places. I wish I could still read stories to him. It's maybe I can, but this has given me hope that I could get through a whole story now. But also, it not only saddened me, but it also comforted me that in his own way, mm -hmm. at only five years old, he was able to find a way which was appropriate to say, okay, we, I must create some distance. And the funny thing is now, in the last few weeks, he has come back and been more loving than ever. I still feel confident about him. Having gone through that, I think, good. He'll understand it his own way. The older boy will understand it his own way. So, at least for me, the answer was, with the older one, just tell him everything. And don't try to figure out how it's going to sound, because they'll remember, they'll know all of these things. And what happens now, talked about what kind of hope another sort of hope is of what they'll remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Mm -hmm. Do you feel up to going on for a while? Sure. Do you have energy? I'd like to ask you, if you can, briefly to describe the gamut of emotions that you've been dealing with and what you would want caregivers to know about that side of things.
But I was first told that uh, that I was expected to die. It was a, a physical reaction, very strong. Uh, almost like I was falling down a well mm. or a vortex. Very hot and flushed. That was a very difficult day. <sighs> you can imagine. I don't see how else it could have been done. There were two different doctors. The surgeon who was now handing me off to the oncologist. Uh, and they were both very honest on this first day. They had to be. Oh, by the way, that reminds me of something I wanted to mention. In the, in the early months, the first couple of months, when this was first being diagnosed, tests going on, I was treated in a very professionally competent way by my primary physician, so-called, at, at the Palo Alto Clinic. That's where I've been going. When I went in for surgery, and from that day to this, I have not heard a single word from that doctor. Not a word. I'm appalled. How can somebody do that? And I'd say at least I'm sorry to hear about this. Well, I wish it had been better. And that he's, that he's out of it. Uh, he has many other patients to deal with. But a small spark of caring, uh, that hurt me, angered me. Uh, by contrast, the surgeon who hasn't uh, touched me in over a year, he even calls me at home from time to time just to see how I'm doing. And that, again, that's those little extra mm -hmm. things that, just to make sure, not, not even in response to a specific emotion, but just try to make sure, just being in touch. And I'll say things like, I always look at even the secondary journals, the, the obscure ones, just in case it's part of this hope mm -hmm. business also, because you never know someone in Japan, which shouldn't be obscure. I mean, I tried to find out some of the literature there and look at that. Or wherever else it took place, might have found more success with something. I think my range of emotions, as I said, there was this alternation between a frenzy of searching mm -hmm. and and a calmness, saying, all right, we've decided on this course of action, and now, for the next two months, uh, that's what I'm going to do. And it was really a, a relief, even, even when I had to eject myself three times a week with this stuff, it was better than running around and trying to figure out what was next. I think my doctor was uh, somewhat annoyed, and I wished that she were a little bit more of an advocate for me in those times when I went through my frenzy. Uh, what else is there? What else? But I can understand from her point of view that if all of her professional training and all the professional training of everyone she knew said this is a hopeless case, that uh, she wouldn't be doing herself or anybody else any good by beating on their door. She said she'd be happy to answer any telephone inquiries if I found somebody who might think that uh, what they were doing applied to my case. Uh, but that in a way it was up to me to find all that. And I was fortunate because I knew a fair number of people and was able to persist and have the physical strength get on the phone and 
pursue it a bit. Uh, you know, it's interesting that that book I mentioned the, about the immune system, the stories in there did not have Hollywood happy endings. Uh, the patients that were mentioned in there, uh, most of them, I think all of them, died. Some of them after really horrendous type of treatment. Uh, but I found in reading them that I was glad to see the truth. I was glad to see that there were some others going through this. And it also cautioned me against going so far where the treatments can be uh, truly bad. Mm. I was also fortunate in having uh, friends nearby. I, mean, I live here, I have access to the medical facility. I don't have to drive in from Visalia. Uh, and I knew other oncologists whom I could talk to informally. They could say, oh yes, so-and-so is a good guy. Don't worry about that or what seems reasonable, or you don't want to do it to Lucom. It's just a mess with terrible side effects. It hasn't really worked up till now. No. It's, it's so funny in a way when you don't, when you don't have that professional, uh, but it's just one friend talking to another. Mm -hmm. It can give you the real skinny on it without having to dress up, and maybe I accepted it better that case. As my doctor, official doctor, was saying the same thing. Uh, but uh, somehow I got through these frenzies. I got on the courses of treatment and I found it a great relief in many ways to say, all right, for the next six weeks I'll be going for a week of chemotherapy, two weeks off, another week two weeks off, and then I'll have the CAT scan. So I didn't have to think about it for that period of time. Mm. Just go through that. That was very calming, a real respite, in spite of the nastiness of the treatment. tell you what I get there. Uh, I'll answer the first one first. I've thought about that question. And I, I, can, I don't know. I can see both sides of it. Uh, in spite of wanting to have this foundation of honesty, there's always this little number in the back of my head. Uh, and if you believe at all in some of the uh, Simonton, Bernie Siegel, all that stuff. Uh, they are dead set against ever saying a date, giving a sentence like that. Uh, just because they believe that people's, they'll follow what they expect. If you tell me I have 18 months to live, sure enough, 18 months, give or take, that's when, that's when you'll die. If you don't have that, and there are just enough stories of people beating such odds, that you say, yeah, maybe that's, that's not the right idea. Of course, there are lots of people who are told that, and it's by that says, oh, that's not me. Forget that. I'm going to be around for another however long it is. And occasionally, they are. In my case, all things considered, I think it was the right thing. Because it gave me some sort of framework for planning, 
some sort of notion of a horizon. I could expect, for example, that uh, my basic physical good health was was holding out uh, right up through this past summer. And this was something that I could expect. When it started to deteriorate, uh, it happened suddenly. I didn't expect it right then, but but it was consistent. After all, there were all these assaults on my body going on all this time. Uh, and uh, I wish I could quote it exactly, but the business of uh, being told of your execution focuses the mind wonderfully. I'd, uh, I'd, uh, it's Samuel Johnson or somebody, mm -hmm. if, if I were just a little more literate, I could quote it offhand. Mm -hmm. uh, because the danger of not having that is that I would continue in the circle of what shall I tell my son? Put off questions like that. Uh, what shall I do about many, many different things? So in my case, I think that that was an important ingredient in making me uh, confront the reality as much as I wanted to. I could take my strong dose of mind over matter and still do the things that I needed to do in case it didn't work. Mm. So for me, that was important. Acceptance. Uh, I, I've, I've read that list somewhere. You know, the Kubler Ross, this sort of thing. Uh, yeah. And I can't tell you, I, I just, you know, it, it's funny, about uh, last May or June, I stopped reading mm. a lot about all these things. When I was first diagnosed, friends of mine flooded me with books and advice and all sorts of things. And I started reading this and that. But after a while, I just said, I'm just going to find my own way and do it a day at a time like this. So I don't know exactly what that, that stage means. Uh, I would say just an offhand definition that yes, I have accepted what's happening to me. Uh, Certain events help. I told you about the three friends from the support group, two of whom are dead, one of whom is slipping very fast. Boy, there's a little reality for you. Uh, I even went to see the man a week ago, and he was sitting up. He had, had a hospital bed installed. He was talking rationally, although once in a while he'd drift off. I went back to see him on Sunday, and he was just nauseous. And able to see anybody. Uh, so, so there's that. At the same time, I'm still getting around. Mm -hmm. And I surprise myself. And, and as long as your mind is engaged, and you meet wonderful people doing things that are, are important like this, and you're engaged in that, you know, you just keep on doing it. Uh, is that accepting death? You know? I ain't dead yet, but I'll tell you, last week, uh, when I finally had the courage to ask my doctor what she thought it would be like near the end, she told me that I would have more trouble eating and that I would be sleeping a lot more. Uh, my eating has actually improved slightly the last week or two. But last week, I just, I was trying to work on some notes from here. I couldn't stay awake for more than 20 minutes. I just had to go back to bed. And I said to myself, excuse me, oh shit, here it comes. So, and I didn't want it to happen so fast. I want, I want this to, I want us to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and I still want to sell my game. <laughs> <laughs> and I still want my, to see my son graduate from elementary school. And the other one graduate from kindergarten. And I want to go for, well, I can't go for long walks. I want to be able to sit and just listen to my wife, just listen to her talk. So do I accept it? I don't know if that meets your definition. Well, I, there's a difference between being resigned, you know, sort of weak resignation, I think, and the qualities you display. You've certainly lived, and one of the wonderful things you did recently was go to Hawaii. And you had, what, 10 days there? I was there for a week. A week. I've never been to Hawaii. Never been. Uh, I was very tired whole time that I was there, but I didn't have to do a lot. <laughs> I sat on the terrace and watched the waves come in and the palms sway and eat pineapple. And I discovered that I could still swim a little bit. It may be hard to believe now looking at me, I used to be a regular swimmer. I'd get up every, alternate between swimming and walking with weights every morning at 6.30. I'd be out and drinking out a pool throughout the winter when some of you fainter-hearted people would be in your beds, fainter-hearted or smarter. <laughs> uh, but actually, I, I did that for about five years, and I think that uh, that explains a lot about how I was able to do so well through some of the early treatments that I had. But uh, Hawaii was a response to how depressed I got <coughs> during Christmas. Uh, on Christmas morning, the solar panels on our roof exploded. Uh -huh. uh, you remember how the frost was at just about a quarter of 10 in the morning. The sun got up high enough and it got just warm enough to unblock the ice, which had been holding the cracks from everything spilling out. It just came spilling over and I just lost it. I thought, oh, what else? Uh, this sort of thing. I think that was a low point. And we went to my uh, wife's family for Christmas dinner that, later that afternoon. And I was able to eat a little bit and they go upstairs and lie down for a while and come back and eat a little bit more and go back upstairs. And she came up and visited me while I was lying up there. And I felt as if, well, we're starting to say goodbye. Because it felt like that we talked about the first time we had Christmas there, which is now only, what, 20 years ago, almost 19 years ago since Christmas. Uh, so all sorts of, of mixed emotions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How's your energy level? Should we say this is enough for today? I feel great. In fact, I feel stronger than I have felt in two weeks <laughs> just doing this. Well, let's take questions. So anybody else, feel free. Yes. Once in a while it is, such as what I uh, told you, I didn't feel as if I could read stories to my son anymore. Uh, most of the time it's fine. They've been really very good. My wife has carried such a load. It's incredible. She works, she supports us. Uh, feel like an old-fashioned Texas pig. She cooks the meal, she cleans up. Of course, I have an excuse. Cancer's a wonderful excuse. No, I can't do that, I got <laughs> cancer. Uh, 
I used to be very good at scout time. Uh, the boys have been very loving, especially the older one has been much more demonstrative. Two years ago, getting him to say I love you was like pulling teeth. Mm. And now, he always asks to me. He says, sleep well, Dad, and wake up well. Huh. And, uh, geez, I get these little, these little charges of life. It's not, it's not quite the way it was. I volunteer at the younger one's class in kindergarten. Uh, and for several months, that was, uh, that was a big kick, just being around five-year-olds. Get a lot of life energy out of that. More recently, it's been a burden. It's been physically difficult, and that's been a bit depressing. And I wasn't getting that charge. It's like I said, with my sense of humor, I used to be able to make more jokes, but I, I can't because I'm saving it up. Uh, so there's no question that the physical sapping mm -hmm. makes some of the relationships hard. But they have been so understanding. The ones who have been difficult have been my parents. That's a whole different side of the coin that I haven't talked about at all. My mother has cancer. She developed breast cancer in 1987. And my father has had heart problems. And it turns out that uh, on the day that I first went to Los Angeles, uh, he went in for a quadruple bypass which they didn't tell me about for a couple of months, this sort of thing. And dealing with them has been a very, very hard. It's, it's all the problems of, uh, that you will experience in middle age dealing with older parents, with this, with this overlayer, this inversion. Things are wrong. Parents in their 70s should not be burying their children. And, uh, and, and they can't, alone among all the people I know, they can't leave it alone, especially my father. He always has one more thing to say. Have you tried this diet or that diet or whatever else? Mm -hmm. uh, and it infuriates me. I just... I just can't abide it. Uh, and it's, it's almost impossible for me to talk about it with him. And it's one of the, the questions I talk about figuring out what to say to my son. I guess the, the, the large remaining problem I have is what to say to my father. And all the lifetime of baggage that we have built up together that is now focused on this in a very unnatural way. Uh, but the answer will come very soon. I've decided I'm just going to uh, either go there, uh, they live on the East Coast, or have them come out here, and we're just going to talk. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we're on the phone every week, but it it isn't the same. I'm a little bit afraid of it. I'm afraid of what I might say, what I might uh, let out, uh, because nobody presses my buttons the way he does. And all you amateur psychologists know about that. Mothers and daughters are the same way. Uh, so we'll see. I'm concerned about that. Missy?
all of my friends are both cheerful and, and realistic. I don't know whether we've gone through some kind of change in society. If you look at movies from 10 or 20 years ago, people were either, couldn't mention the big C word, or just, just couldn't talk about it at all, or, or they were just so mindlessly cheerful, couldn't do anything about it. Somehow, with the people I care about who come to visit me, and there are a lot of them, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I'm very honest about it. I tell them exactly what's happened. This hasn't worked. I decided to stop whatever it was. And then we can talk further. So there isn't the sort of undergrowth that you have to clear away, that you might imagine you'd have to clear away. It's it's honest, and it, and it still feels uh, we're just not burdened with, with that sort of thing. I recommend that, yeah. by the way. That's the only way to do it. You mentioned volunteering in the kindergarten. You've also been busy in the community with other things. That's right. Uh, this organization I, I mentioned uh, it's called Leadership Palo Alto, which is a leadership training program for people interested in community service. And I joined that as a participant in 1987. I think when I first had the inklings that uh, who sold more computers than uh, somebody else wasn't really important to me anymore. Uh, and I was looking for something else. And this is one of the first things I started. I've been very much involved with that. I'm on the advisory board now, although, again, cancer is a great excuse. I haven't, I haven't done a lot for them lately, but uh, they all still come and visit, which is very nice. Uh, and I think that they, they may very well help to underwrite this, uh, this lecture series. I was also on the, on the board of the Palo Alto Foundation for Education, which was a small attempt to get around some of the constraints of Proposition 13, do some private fundraising, give money to teachers for special projects that they couldn't otherwise get. Uh, and uh, that just took too much energy, so I just had to stop that one altogether. Uh, but as long as the energy held up, you, were, you weren't just looking inwardly. You kept looking out and trying to make a, a difference, right? Yes, very much so. I, I was also a member of the uh, site council at my kids' school, which is a body that uh, controls certain state monies to be spent on various things. And uh, as recently as December, we were arguing about the relative merits of different Xerox machines. <laughs> so, I mean, there are all sorts of uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. or they said they, they help me to look outward somewhat, and that's important. There are parts of my personality that I think have, have gotten in the way a bit of cancer treatment. Uh, you hear about the physician in Athens who has a secret serum he can't reveal that people fly over there to get an injection uh, wherever it happens to be, Mexico. Uh, 
I have too much, I have too much of a scientific background to believe in that. You have to place yourself in something of a trance. You have to believe if there's to be any hope for that sort of thing at all, I think. I don't discount it entirely, but I think that somebody who uh, was less introspective, more uh, respectful of authority altogether, whatever their credentials, uh, would be a better candidate for some of the more uh, outlandish and possibly bogus types of treatment. I call it bogus, but you know, there are just enough people. That, that's the thing that holds us together. I've seen people gave me volumes of regressional testimony about some doctor in New York who has a some kind of track record. I think a, a congressman's sister-in-law was cured of cancer. They had 75 pages of the congressional record talking about this with testimonials of people coming through there. But it's the sort of thing where you have to believe. And I couldn't bring myself to believe in that. I read up on things like uh, macrobiotics. I went to uh, a Chinese healer once and talked to him about what he might have to offer. I was not excluding anything that I thought might have a, a system that I could make some sense out of if I simply opened my mind to it. Uh, I found that macrobiotics, uh, even though I, I was for a while a vegetarian uh, during all of this, uh, that uh, depended on a certain philosophy. It's not simply that you eat brown rice all the time. That's, not, that's only half the story. The other half is a certain belief in a, in a certain unity of the living things on the planet. And uh, I, I wasn't prepared to invest in that. I couldn't bring myself to that level of belief. Uh, should I have? No. I, I think, as I said before, I've made the right decisions for me. But somebody could make different decisions, and they would be right for them. I'm very fortunate in that I'm a Jew and my wife is Catholic, so we had two strong forces going for us. Uh, I know two rabbis very well, dear personal friends of mine. There are, uh, at his Yom Kippur sermon a year ago, the rabbi talked about the death of his brother from AIDS. I didn't know how much that meant to me at the time, but he talked about teshuvah, which means turning. It was a, a reawakening, this kind of opening I talked about. He talked about tzedakah, which is charity, helping others, turning outward, no matter <coughs> what it was, and brachot, which is prayers, and trying to build whatever bridge to eternity that you can. You could sum that up in a shorthand as faith, hope, and charity. And you could do a lot worse than that. Uh, on my wife's side, uh, I have a legion of people praying for me, saying masses every single day. And 
In fact, a healer came to my house. Uh, he's a friend of my brother-in-law. And we talked together for a while. He's a very special person. And towards the end, when I, I got quite emotional about it. And he anointed me. And about where he was saying certain things over me, I actually had a vision of Jesus opening his hands to be like this. And believe me, I never expected to see that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so where does chaplaincy fit in? It's got to be personal. It's got to be something that's based on the fundamentals of the religion or the religions that you draw strength from. Uh, and you have to accept as much as possible. Just be open about it. Uh, these were the things that were most important to me. And how that translates into a working chaplaincy in a hospital or something, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, the chaplain at Stanford never came to see me that I know of. Although the odd thing was that there are some things I don't remember of my stays here. Part of the drugs wiped out my memory of what happened. That, that's another point. They didn't tell me that huh. beforehand. And it was kind of unnerving for somebody to come to me later and say, oh, yes, I came to see you on Wednesday. We had this talk and so on. And apparently there's something about the drug that blocked transfer from short-term to long-term memory. And 20 minutes after they were out of the room, man, they were gone. Uh, so for all I know, a chaplain may have showed up in one of those intervals. Uh, but I did not get uh, any contact here with any of the chaplains, so I don't know how that works. Maybe you can answer that better than I can. I think what you said about being open and respectful and meeting you where you are, I think the very last thing you want is somebody to lay a trip on you. You know, their agenda, their religious agenda. <coughs> when I spoke about having a vision of Jesus, uh, I didn't regard that at all as an imposition. Uh, or somebody else's agenda. No, 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 that was, you were invited that. I invited that, mm -hmm. and uh, it was part of being open to, to certain things that were possible. Why did I not want to eat the brown rice and, and believe in the, the whole macrobiotic program, whereas it would go against uh, several thousand years of my history mm -hmm. to embrace Jesus? Well, Jesus is my kinsman mm -hmm. and my cousin. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I like him <laughs> personally. That's we, there's a whole other set of things that yeah. we don't need to talk about. Right. But uh, uh, again, it was my sense of hope and a certain amount of control, being able to choose. Mm -hmm. Here is what what I will believe in. Here is what will work for me. And perhaps the advice for the chaplain is the same advice to the doctor. You try to understand who this patient is, put yourself in his shoes, mm -hmm. and do what you need for that person. Well, I fear that we have exhausted you, and I know, I know. How are you going to feel after this, if you yeah. will forgive me saying so? Because uh, Dr. King came to see me a couple of weeks ago and really got himself psyched up. And then you had a letdown. And I'm just a little afraid that you're going to have a similar depletion of energy when we end the session. Take a cold shower and run around the All place. right, all right. But I tell you, this has been a most moving and instructive and touching uh, afternoon for everybody in this room. And I can't tell you how much we are indebted to you. The lectureship in your memory is something that I myself 
am really committed to. And I hope that you're at the first and maybe more of the annual Dr. Jonathan King lecture, lecture series. But I certainly will vividly recall this afternoon whenever I'm privileged to be at any of those events. I want to thank you, and I want to thank all of you also. I think what you're doing is very, very important. Just keep doing it. Uh, you've certainly helped me a lot today, and you're going to help a lot of people in the future. You've got a lot of good work ahead of you, so thank you in advance. Okay. I'm going to give you a hug. I'll be careful this <laughs> time. That is wonderful. Thank you. thank you. Do you want to take a stretch break? And then we'll come back and talk for 10 minutes.